pleasure uh, to be the only not official number theorist among the speaker here. So as you will see that uh, there are actually lots of number theory. Uh, so my lecture notes is posted on the web and there are three chapters. The first one uh, is a review of torque geometry. And that, that's sort of a small subset of uh, Victor Butler's talk. So uh, that just set up my notation. I will actually start with chapter two. Uh, which is the main part of uh, uh, my lecture series. And then chapter three, that's sort of uh, uh, very sketchy, and uh, not, I will not have enough time to discuss chapter three, and that's for, for further questions, for further investigation. So the uh, main topic of my course is to study the zeta function of uh, alpha <coughs> hypersurface in uh, N-torus over a finite field, and we'll study the basic property, and then in particular, we'll uh, study what happened in the case of uh, uh, Calabial hypersurfaces. So let's start with uh, uh, zeta function. So what is zeta function? <laughs> My hand is too big. <laughs> Okay, that's great. Then. So I will start with a finite field of Q elements, and where Q is certainly a power of a prime number P, H power, where P is prime, prime number. And uh, let's say we're given a polynomial, and in fact, in this case, it's Roland polynomial. So this will be a polynomial with coefficients in a finite field of Q elements. So Roland polynomial has both positive and negative power. And of course, this polynomial defines an alpha hypersurface. I will use u instead of z because z is reserved for zeta functions. So uf is just the hypersurface defined by the polynomial. So it will be just those points in the n torus such that f of x equal to zero. So that is an <coughs> alpha algebraic variety of a hypersurface. And we're interested in counting the number of rational points. So this is a set of rational points where the coordinates are in FQ and satisfy the equation, if you find the equation. So we want to star. add a star, that's right, Torres. And we want to count the number of rational points. More generally, not just this set, we want to count rational points over every finite extension. So we're k, one, two, three. Of course, in number theory, when you have a, such a sequence, you associate uh, a z function, a generation function. In this case, it is the z function. Z of u f t is Exponential of this sequence of number, number of points of this variety over a case extension field. So that's that is a power theory. That's a form of power theories, and it actually has a integer coefficient, simply because it has a Euler product uh, expansion. So the sequence of a rational number, uh, number of rational points is encoded in this generating function. So if you are, all the question about the rational points can be reduced to information about this zeta function. And uh, the basic property, the, which in this course we're going to discuss is Basic property as well as basic questions which we are going to study. The first, the first one is the analytic property. So, as a power series, what is the analytic behavior? And this part is, is a complete answer by Dwarf's fundamental theorem, which says this is actually a rational function. 
So it's not just meromorphic, it's actually a rational function. And so, if it's rational, of course, then you can write it as a numerator and denominator, and you can factor the numerator and denominator. It has some, some zero and some pole. Let's say the d2 pole, and then let's say the d1 zero, where alpha i and beta j are actually algebraic integer. So of course, you take a logarithm on both sides, then you find a formula for the number of rational points. This is just sigma beta j to the k minus sigma alpha i to the k. Okay, so one, two, three. So basically, if you know the zeta function, that means you know the zero and the pole, then you know the number of rational points over every finite extension field. So that's a general property. And this holds without, without any condition for f. For any hypersurface. Now, so next we want to say further information about this data function. I mean, for, for that purpose, it is good to assume certain condition on this uh, polynomial f, and that condition has been defined by the reflector, which is called a non-degenerate. <coughs> and I think in his paper he initially used the regular, so I'd like to use the regular word because it's shorter. So let's say assume f is a regular, is actually delta regular, this is a polytope. In this case, you can see more inf precise information about this zeta function. In this case, you can show the zeta function has this uh, more specific form, which is a, uh, so there are some trivial factor, which is the main term. So the trivial factor would be just the more like more or less like the torus, but it's not exactly the torus. This is the trivial part. Negative one to n minus i. And choose i plus one. So this is the trivial factor. And then times, times a polynomial raised negative one to the nth power. So in general, of course, when the zeta function is only a rational function, it has some zero in the pole. In the case of this hypersurface is regular, then essentially there's only one piece. After some trivial factor, you only have one polynomial left to determine, which is so f t f t is actually a polynomial with integer coefficients. And what is the degree of this polynomial? <coughs> essentially the d of uh, delta degree is d of delta minus one. So I will start with zero instead of one because later I want to match with the slope. You could start with one d delta minus one, so. So this is a polynomial with the integer coefficient. And a degree of degree d of delta minus one D of delta would be just the degree of this polytope. I think that will be defined sooner or later during one of the lectures by someone. Right. So, that, so in the case of delta regular hypersurface, we have a better understanding of the shape of the zeta function. That's the second part. And in terms of the rational points, what does this mean? So in terms of zeta function, okay, I'm going to do Move this page now. There's no, another, no third, another second projector. So in terms of the zeta function, in terms of the number of rational points, what does this mean? In the regular case, this means the number of uh, rational points of the case extension field. OK, the trivial factor really comes from this part. This is the main term to the k minus one to the nth power plus minus one to the n plus one's power divided by the k to the k. So the trivial factor is really the zeta function of this sequence, which is very explicit. And the non-trivial part comes given by this beta, beta zero to k. So 
So that's a formula for the number of rational points. Therefore, in this formula, everything is determined except this beta, this root beta. So the remaining question is determine this beta. What can we say about this beta? Of course, in general, if you are given polynomial with integer coefficients, you're asking for the roots of the polynomial. That's a very hard question. So we're trying to understand the property of these roots. And uh, it turns out the roots, these roots satisfy the Riemann hypothesis, which in a weaker form, this is sort of the less or equal to Q to the n minus 1 over 2. So remember, n minus 1 is the dimension of the hypersurface. So n minus 1 over 2, Q to that one, that'll be just Riemann hypothesis. This is true for origin. And that gives you a sharp estimate. This is main term plus error term. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, I just forgot. Yeah? Did you say the D delta? D delta is the, is n factorial times the volume of this polytope. I should have said that. But this was, you know, we'll define that later. So it's something that's a combinatorial number. Uh, that's, you can think of that as the beta number. Now, more precisely, in fact, Dorin's theorem shows that the, the complex of the value is actually square root of q to the wj, where wj is actually integer between 0 up to dimension, which is n minus 1. So it's an integer in this interval. So more precisely, you could ask, what is this wj? Let's say you arrange them in increasing order to determine what is this wj. And that can be determined. And that has been determined. I think that was determined by the Nifflow Sir using using interest intersection cohomology. Um, so WJ can be determined in this case. <coughs> now this beta J actually is a brick integer, so we're just looking at it as a complex of variable. Now from number theory the point of view, and that's rich integer, you can also look at it. And it's a long Archimedean absolute variable. So for each prime, num prime number, you can all, all look at it's a long Archimedean absolute variable. So let's say, so if you look at the best suppose L is a prime number, so L is a prime, different from the characteristic P, it turns out this beta G is not divisible by L at all. They're just analytic units. So this actual absolute variable is one. What this means is this means that power of L dividing this algebraic integer is zero. There's no L inside this algebraic integer. You really should view this algebraic integer into some analytic uh, number field and look at the analytic valuation. And here, no, note I assume L is different from T. Of course, if beta G has no, yeah. is an analytic unit for every prime, then that would be just roots of unity. But of course, our beta G is more complicated than the rules of the unity. So what's left is, therefore, the periodic absolute variable. Let's say, again, F delta regular. Then what can we say about this periodic absolute variable or periodic absolute variable? And that, of course, you can always write this into Q to the negative SG, let's say. SJ will be a real number. Turns out SJ will be a number between a real number between zero and then minus one, and uh, it's not going to be a, an integer. It's not going to be a half integer. Even half integer is not enough. The real hypothesis here is basically just WJ divided by two, so that's like a half integer. And here you would hope it's half integer as well, but that's, that's not enough. So we can only say it's a rational number. <coughs> and in this case, so the question is, we want to determine what is this SJ? This is called the slope, the QID slope of this algebraic number, this V number. And there we said the WJ, the weights. So this WJ is called weight. And here is the SJ called slope. 
So we can also ask, how do we determine the slope? And this question turned out to be more complicated because it depends. The weight only depends on the, the, this beta number, this, the, this, uh, the geometry. And this, this slope is more arithmetic in nature. It actually depends on which polynomial you take. No matter how smooth it is, also depends on which prime number you're taking at. Because the integer, if you take a different number of p, then that's value will be different. So this is, this is, a, this is a highly arithmetic problem. Q is the power of p, is the number of elements in my finite field. It's the power of p, so Q is a... Well, on the right, but on the left, there are several, several prime ideals for evaluation. Right, that's right. So over p, then, we, what do you do another way is you embed beta j into, you embed, embed you take real roots in a p-dic... Uh, is it independent of which embedding you take? Uh, the sequence is independent, the sequence of the SJ is independent of the which embedding you take. Of course, for, a, for, a, for, a, for a roots, beta j, you may take the different uh, idea or prime ideal line above you. It could be different, that just permute. So what do we do? You, you can just fix one prime ideal above and then you get a sequence. You've changed uh, the idea that this permute this, this number. Okay, so, and it turns out, uh, this number, turns out to be related to the Hutch number. And then, in fact, the more complicated than the Hutch number. The Hutch number will only give you a, a lower bound. It doesn't give you the, the slope. But that's sort of the first approximation. And we discuss this question. Uh, so this, this is a data function for a single hypersurface. And the final question you can ask is uh, the variation. So next question you can ask is, so how this number, how SJ, and more generally the zeta function, vary as your variety vary? Of course, when F vary, in geometry, you only let the coefficients vary, and you, you fix the field. But for number theory, there are two kinds of variation. One is arithmetic variation, one is geometric variation. Arithmetic variation means you, you can take a polynomial with integer coefficients, for instance. You reduce much different than p, you let the p vary. And that is arithmetic variation, and that is much harder. harder. Or you can fix your characteristic p, and let the coefficients vary over an extension field. That's more like a geometric variation. And there it's better understood. And uh, so we discuss uh, mostly geometric variation because arithmetic variation is uh, sort of too difficult. But we'll touch on a few uh, questions of arithmetic variation in nature later on. So th these are sort of the general uh, question and the theory for an arbitrary uh, alpha and hypersurface in torus. In torus. And, uh, I think parts of the, one of the motivation for this uh, conference is uh, to study the relation with the, with the carbon yaw hypersurface of mirror symmetry. So you could ask, can we say anything more in the case of a carbon yaw hypersurface? Because you have an extra condition, then you're supposed to be able to say more. So what more can be said? about all of these questions, in particular zeta function. F, F is a club of varieties. So this is basically uh, the outline of the topic that I'm gonna discuss. And uh, during the next few lectures, then uh, I give some idea about these results and these questions. And uh, the material in my lecture notes that that's, that's, that's too much for, for five lectures. So I focus on the uh, chapter two, which will be sufficient for the five lectures, I think, already. Um, and I was asked to give a somewhat more detail. My initial uh, lecture notes was more sketchy, and later the organizer asked me to provide some detail. So I tried to provide some detail as well to give a little intuition. Um, the later lecture will contain less detail, but it's, it's easier to understand. 
the first one's lecture has more detail, but uh, it's, uh, it's actually more elementary in nature. Oh, that's 20 minutes already. OK, so let's uh, start with uh, zeta function. And it turns out uh, the zeta function is related to L function. Uh, the exponential sum in this case. So let's start with uh, an additive character of FP. This is a prime field, prime finite field of P elements. We start with a, a complex character. So you just take X maps to the, you take the, let's say, a piece root of unity, and then you raise to, uh, so that would be a piece root of unity, a primitive piece root of unity. If you raise it to X power, that would be another piece root of unity. And of course, this only depends on the residue class of X modulo P, so it's well defined. This is multiplicative character and it's non-trivial. And uh, once you have this character, then you can f form a sequence of character for each finite extension. Let's say, if you have a finite extension of FP, say FP, Q to the K, then you can take the trace first down to FP. What? Uh, I want to use FQ to the K. You can use P, P to the K because my, it doesn't matter which field, it's just finite extension, so you can just take, take the trace down. And then let's compose with this uh, C. So this will be uh, my additive character. Um, the extension field. Now, given such a <coughs> character, then I can define a sequence of exponential sum, SK. And I will throw you an extra variable, and you will see why. In the first lecture, you have seen why there's an extra variable, x0, and it, we see that this is very natural, this x0 comes in. So I first define this exponential sum, a sum over all the, the variable runs over all non-zero ele elements, because I'm working with the torus. So all the fq to the k star, and now I have n plus one variable. plus one variable, and uh, the value of this character, of x zero f. Okay, so I form this character sum. So you just plug in this value of x, and you take the trace that give you, uh, supposedly, this is an in an cyclotomic field, but for this particular polynomial, x0 times f, the sum is actually an integer. Rational integer, not in an extension field. You can use Gala theory, or you will see later on actually why this is true. Now, how this sum relates to our number of rational points? There's a simple relation in terms of counting. So, the point, the number of, uh, we're interested in this number of rational points on the hypersurface for a cap surface, this, this is what we're really interested in. And if I multiply this by Q to the K, it turns out that this is just relates to, to that sum. Well, you just can't, well, this is actually, you can see this is Xi in FQ to the K star. Now I vary from one up to N, and I separate this variable to X0. X0 will be runs over all elements, including zero element and this C of uh, trace, x0 of f. So this is a counting function. Just check. So given this xi, if it's a point, let me f of equal to zero, then this gives you q to the k term, exactly q to the k. And if, given this xi, if f of x is not zero, when you sum over x0, that gives you zero. So that's a counting function, exactly counting. And now you have separated the, the second sum into two parts. One is x0 equal to 0, one is x0 is not equal to 0. So you can prove that directly. You see it from this line as well. Okay. So if x0 equal to 0, 
this is always one. And this is the cube of the k minus one to the x power, that main term. So that's the number of points on the n torus. That's the main term. And then plus, x zero is non zero. That means the sum is just that sum. So let's give you another proof of that's an integer, because the left side is an integer. This one is an integer, that's an integer as well. Right? Uh, the x is to x, xi? F is a polynomial of this x1, x2, xn. Right, so f is a polynomial in the, in the variable x1 up to xn. So of course, therefore, to count the number of rational points of this, this hypersurface, you only need to study this exponential sum. They are really uh, determine each other in a simple way. The only difference is just differ by torus. Okay, so now if you plug in this into the zeta function, then you are reduced to study the L function of this one, so which I will define now. Okay, in this formula, simple one. So if I define the L function of this polynomial to be this generating series of this sequence of sum, this will be uh, SK, 0F. Then the zeta function, this hypersurface, and if you change the variable, T to Q to T, this will be just the zeta function of the n torus, which is a very simple, times the L function of, of this zero, of this polynomial x zero f. So uh, enough to study this L function. That's really sort of the, the, the main part, the, the interesting part. The other part is the trivial factor is uh, the n torus. Okay, then how do we understand this exponential sum? Now this exponential sum, the uh, associated to this uh, piece, piece, piece power character, which is a complex character. However, uh, in the theory of arithmetic geometry, there's a, in the proof of rationality, there's no proof Director using this complex character, or the proof has to use some non archimedean tool, either Pietic or Arabic. So there's no proof director you can just work with this complex uh, character sum and then derive the, derive the rationality. There's no such proof available. If you find one, that would be wonderful, it would be great. That would be an entirely new approach. So the approach which I'm going to discuss is, is the Pietic one, as studied by Dorp. So that means we should view this Pietic. Uh, Piece root of unity as a PDIC number, and then study this sum from PDIC point of view, use PDIC analysis. So the first question is, we should construct this piece root of unity as a PDIC number. How do we describe this piece root of unity as a PDIC uh, embedded in this PDIC number field? So that's sort of the next uh, uh, topic. So Dork's Pietic character. Now, of course, the construction of the, uh, of the character, we start with a primitive piece root of unity. Once you start with a piece root of unity, then you just raise it to the x power, and that gives you the character. So to construct the Pietic character, again, we need to start with a primitive piece root of unity in the Pietic number field. So you have to con give, construct one, not trivial one, and then by raise to x power, that gives you the, the periodic uh, character. So how do we construct one? Then we want to use some sort of a power series, periodic an analysis. And this turns out, uh, as there, are, there are many construction, and uh, this one looks technically a little bit more complicated, but it's actually the best. It gives the, the, the most information. So we start with this uh, arlen hausa series, Power series, exponential series. So this is just uh, let's say the e, uh, you know the EPT to be 
exponential. So that would be a classical power exponential series. And this one turns out to be too crude to, num to, to, to number theory because the radius of convergence is too small from a particular point of view. So we're going to modify it so that it has a better radius of convergence. So, okay, this, this power series looks pretty big and complicated. It actually behaves better than an exponential function itself. So presumably this is a rational power series with a rational coefficients. And uh, denominator could be very complicated. And it turns out the denominator is like, it's not too bad. This has a product expansion. You can check. All of its product, well, all of those integers are relative prime to p. And that's one minus t to the k raised to the negative mu to the k divided by k, where mu is a mu of function. All right. Now, because k and the p are relative prime, you have, when you expand this as a binomial series, you see it's power series with p integer coefficients. Therefore, the whole thing has pitting integer coefficients. And that, that one doesn't have pitting integer coefficients. And this, I mean, the first one exponential doesn't have pitting integer coefficients. So this one does. So this is a power series with pitting integer coefficients. Of course, it's worth a rational number. So it's just. Uh, of course, you can just check this by taking logarithm and compare the coefficients. But that's a proof. Uh, so this is not complicated at all. And this shows, in particular, this converge periodically in the open unit disk. That's all. This uh, the radius of convergence is already bigger than the exponential function t. But this is not enough because for us we need to, to put in something like t is one in there, and this doesn't converge. You put t is one. Because the coefficient doesn't go to zero, so you put t to one, it doesn't work. Well, if you make change of variables, it will work. So, uh, so this is this is adding has a power series. So I should say this doesn't convert. So uh, convert, but not on the boundary. It converts in the open unit disk, but does not convert on the boundary. Okay, so how do we construct the primitive piece root of unity? For us, we, to do that, we need to choose a root. So, let's define. So let pi be a fixed root of this power series, t plus t to the p plus t to the p square over p square, the root of this this one in periodic number. Of course, this has many roots. This has infinite many roots. So we choose a root with this property such that, of course, pi is not going to be zero. So we choose a one with a variation exactly equal to one over p minus one. And it turns out that exactly Exactly, the p minus one such roots. So to find the, the roots, you just draw the Newton polygon of this power series. You find that there's a side of slope one over p minus one with horizontal lines p minus one. So that means that exactly p minus one roots with this slope. So they're just p minus one, and they're just fix one. Let's choose one, fix one. And it turns out this one generates, it's an algebraic number, it generates the same field as the primitive piece root of unity in QP. So in fact, pi is just uniformizer in this uh, cyclotomic field. So pi is actually a uniformizer. Because uh, the ramification is p minus one, so pi is a uniformizer. So you can think of pi as approximately one minus zeta p. Because one minus zeta p is also uniformizer. They're just different by a unit, a periodic unit. Of 
course, you should ask, why don't we choose that one? Uh, and there's a reason for that. OK, so once we have fixed this choice of pi, then we can define a power series, which just defines theta of t to be the adding half power series. Remember, we have this adding half power series, which has integer, integer coefficients, but does not converge on the boundary. Now, if we shift this one, so the radius of convergence will be bigger. So this is, the, is convergent in t to the p less than, initially it's one, but now you have this pi. So now you can put t is one in there because then, then it's pi, pi is small. So this will be converging in, in p to the one over p minus one. This is bigger than the closed unit disk. So now you can plug in pi. Uh, pi t is a, a unit into this power series. I think if you expand this, what is the first term? The first term is one, second term is like pi uh, t plus other term. Other term gets, later on, gets a bit more complicated. That's sort of the first few terms is very simple, just like exponential series. Uh, second term would be pi squared, t squared divided by two factorial. Well, if p is two, then that's a little different. Okay, now, from this, you can say now you can plug in t is one and they converge. So set of one uh, is one plus pi modulo pi square. So if modulo pi square say that one is just uh, and this is clear, this means set of one is different from one, right? Because uh, modulo pi square is it's not one already, so it's not one. And it turns out actually theta one is a primitive piece root of unity and then piece power will be equal to one. So this theta one will be, a, so we have constructed, explicitly constructed piece root of unity by choosing a pi. And uh, right. so once we start with a, we have a piece root of unity, we can construct this uh, character. So we're going to change our definition of a character from a complex number. Now, instead of looking at a complex number, we're looking at the replace complex number by a periodic number. So it's the same definition, of course, just raised to x to theta 1 to the x power. That's basically the periodic construction of this uh, character, additive character, non-trivial one. So once you have a this one, of course, you can compose with, let's say, a trace of a, I'll start with p to the k now, as one of the orders suggested, f p to the k to f p. <coughs> so this would be from uh, f p to the k, then you take the trace down to f p, and then compose. Now, of course, what is this? We want to have a, some more, more structural description of this uh, character over an extension field. So here, it turns out for this one, maybe I should use bar because in character P, and this one turns out that you can put this X bar inside X, in, inside theta. So of course, we put a X bar inside, the outside is a characteristic P, the inside is a characteristic zero. So you have to replace the x bar by some element in character zero. And here, x is sort of the tension mirror lifting of x bar. So which is the piece root of unity, and it's reduced to, to x bar. And similarly here, so what is this uh, to see of, if you are in an extension field, and uh, what is the formula for, okay, so here for x in fp, then this will give you a very nice formula for the character. So you have this power series. 
So to evaluate this the value of this character at x bar, you just lift x bar to x, and then plug it in to this analytic power series, which is convergent. So that gives you an analytic formula for, for this uh, additive character. And a similar one to have a similar formula for the value of an extension field. In this case turns out to be, of course, set up x. But x is not in an extension in, in ground field anymore, it's in an extension field. So you need to multiply by its conjugate. To k minus one. So basically this character is completely determined by this power zero to set of x. And that gives you the, the pattern to compute the value. You just substitute x into the power zero is multiplied by its conjugate, and that will give you the and this one of course this this is a this is a pitting integer, it's a roots of unity. Each individual term is not a roots of unity here in the extension field. The product is a roots of unity, the piece of roots of unity. So of course, in there it's piece of roots of unity. Here, x in the extension field, it's this not each factor is not a roots of unity, but the product is, is one. Okay, so that gives you the, the description of the piece character. So now, once we have this pure construction of the additive character, then of course our purpose is to understand this uh, exponential sum, the sequence of exponential sum, which uh, which is used to, to connect to the zeta function. Okay, now let's return to the alpha function, this exponential sum. So this kind of periodic representation of this sequence of it. exponential sum. And uh, for this purpose, let's say we write our Roland polynomial, I'll use f bar because the coefficient is in the fq now, and then later I'm going to lift that. So I write this as, let's say, aj x0, xvj, j from 1 to j. And assume this aj bar is in fq. Okay? And this is a polynomial, Roland polynomial. This, this one is a Roland polynomial in FQ. So if I'm writing this form, the Q is, remember, Q is the power of P. Okay, so now we compute this exponential sum. By definition, this is just sigma all x i bar vary over f cubed k star. And then we trace of preserve trace. X zero f bar. Right? Now because this is the additive character, so this separate the sum into product. So this would be just the same as a bar. This will become the product. So you substitute x0 f by, by this uh, exp additive expansion, and then because this is a multiplicative, so this just thing one to j, and each term is k. And what's left is a monomial. This would be just ag bar x0 x vg. Yeah. Now, now we can use Dwork's uh, Analytic construction of the additive character replace this by, by this theta. This is what he called a splitting function. So here it is a sum over characteristic uh, p. But eventually when we come to point, we want to work over characteristic zero. So that's why it is harder to find the integer instead of finding the integer modulo p. Finding the modulo p, as in the second lecture, you, can, you have a much simpler counting function. And here you really have something much more complicated. <coughs> capture the whole information. So then of course, to change it to curve zero, then we just lift so this xi will be the tension middle lift of xi bar. This will be empiric number. And this is again q, q to the k minus one roots of unity. That's the lifting. 
And uh, here, this one. And what is this one? This one, in terms of the, remember, this would be just theta of x j, x zero, x v j, right? <coughs> this would be p to the i. So you plug in this number into the, this uh, power series, and you multiply by all its conjugate. So multiply conjugate means just with p to the i's power, i vary from now, a k minus one. It's simply because my q to the k equals p to the ak. That's why I have to go to the ak minus 1 instead of the k, because I already have an a there. OK. So that, that gives you the, an analytic representation of this uh, sum. And now I want to organize this a little bit using uh, define a new power series simplify the notation. So I write a power series, depending on this f, power series in x, we we'll just sigma j from 1 to j, the set of the j, x0, x, v, j. Right. And this would be a power series with coefficients in where? I will use zq pi. So what is zq? zq is an unified extension of zp of degree a. Remind us it's an of the z p on the join pi with coefficient. This is a coefficient, and this will be power series. If it doesn't hurt, you put a positive neg minus one here as well. So here we only have positive power in mean x zero. So that's a power that I have, I have. And I also define f a f of x equal to product AJ, X, V, J, P to the I. So that's just a, a partial product there. And this one turns out just to be, a, this is determined by that one. So once you have that one, then you just raise to a F, XP, and it turns out it's not exactly because there's a full mean section here, tau is minus one, F of X, P to the A minus one. So here's tau is a full minus. Uh, full minus, P is power of full So basically, if you know this power series, uh, F, then you can determine f of a, and, it, and that sum is just a, a sum over uh, expression involving f a. So finally, we put this together, separate this, this into a product like this, and then we'll get this formula. 